Hello, brothers and sisters in Christ. Grace and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all and my love for you, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. This might be a short study, but um, I was someone came over on the gospel message that we have on this channel, and they were attacking the, what we say, changed life. The Bible talks about you're a new creature in Christ Jesus. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. There's a change in your life. Uh, new creature in Christ Jesus, you have a new life. Okay, born again, the new birth. Okay. But they're like, well, the, the gospel sounds great, but you don't have to have a changed life. You have all these easy believism people that just attack, attack the new birth. They will try to pervert what the Bible says the new birth is. Now, we're not, we've got videos where we go into great detail, but I just wanted to... One of his comments that he makes is very important, brothers and sisters Christ, to understand the excuse that they use. And I want to show how they're wrong according to the scripture. So one of the comments that he came, this person came back with, and I pray that they are truly saved, and they're just newly saved, and God's just working on them. But they said, it depends on the life you have lived before you were saved. That depends on whether you have a changed life, as they say. Like I said, a new birth. No, the new birth is guaranteed after salvation. The new life is guaranteed after salvation. But they're saying, it depends on the life that you have lived before you were saved. I already lived a clean life before I was saved. So my changes were less big. I got rid of some music and several movies. Well, let that sink in real quick. Remember that. Several movies. But I never had drugs liquor, or any other greater sins I could have gotten rid of. Okay, I got rid of junk food also, but the evidence of salvation comes through calling upon the name, upon the Lord, obedience to the gospel, not a changed life. Yet the Bible teaches time and time again, obeying the gospel is having a changed life, living for Jesus Christ. He becomes Lord of your life. Lord of your life, King of Kings. The Bible says that feed the church of God which he had purchased with his own blood. You belong to Jesus Christ. You were bought with a price. Jesus comes into your life through the Holy Spirit, opens the books to you, and starts commanding you. The Bible says, ye are my friends, this is Jesus speaking, ye are my friends, if, the Bible if, you do whatsoever I command you. If a man love me, he will keep my words, that my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. Thy word have I hid in my heart, that I might not sin against thee. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to his word. This book, and the Holy Spirit in you, is going to produce a change in your life. How you think, how you talk, how you live. But they're trying to attack the changed life, and their excuse is, is what if somebody lived a clean life before they got saved? And they're talking about them. Okay? Turn to Romans chapter 1. Romans 1. 132. Let's start up in verse 28. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind. God in their knowledge. God's way. What pleases God. Never mind. To do those things which are not convenient, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, Remember what this person said? Well, what if they didn't have that in their life? I didn't have it in my life, a lot of this stuff in my life. I, was, I lived a clean life. I had to give up a little bit of sin here and there. But, I mean, I had a little sin in my life, but I didn't have that. I, I, I was pretty much a clean person. I was pretty much a good person. Let's keep reading here. Full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers, backbiters. Haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents. Without understanding, 
covenant breakers, without natural affection, implicable, unmerciful. Now stop for a second. I'm getting ahead of myself. When I, if you look at my testimony, when I got saved, if I was to redo my testimony, looking back with what God has shown me, I put more wickedness in my lost life that God has showed me that I was doing wrong, sinning, worldliness, lust of the flesh, doing things Satan way, Satan's way, pride, deception, Satan's way, pride, deception, lying. He's the father of lies. He's the king of all the children of pride. Amen. When I look back, I realized all these things, when I first got saved, I was like, yeah, I'm wicked, I came to God broken, I'm wicked, I'm a sinner, I'm dirty, I'm rotten. I didn't realize how dirty and rotten I was until this book started shining on my life. I could go down there when I first got saved and was like, yeah, I'm guilty of some of these things. And then after, I mean, at salvation, I'm guilty of some of these things and that's why I need to get saved, I've sinned against God. After salvation... I practically guilty, was guilty of all of them almost, if not all of them. Oh yeah, we'll get to that in this next verse, verse 32. Who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death. Not only, the, only, not only that do the same, because here's where it comes in. This is what the easy believism doesn't like. Not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. What did he just say up there? I've never done drugs, liquor, or any other greater sins. But what did he just say he had to give up? He had to give up movies. You know there's drugs in movies? Liquor, sodomy, fornication, feminism. And he keep going, lying. Stealing, lovers of death, yeah, lovers of death, haters of God. I can keep going and going and going. Those are in movies that he had to give up. But the Bible says that even though he didn't, might not have physically gone out and gotten drunk, but if you watched a movie where they're promoting drunkenness, you're as guilty as, being, as that man that goes out there and gets drunk. You're just as guilty because you took pleasure in them that do it. Hollywood movies, you are guilty of such sins if you take pleasure in them that do them. I speak from experience. You look at a man who's addicted to video games, and video games promote lovers of death, Satanism, false gods, feminism, sodomy, fornication. A lot of you'd be so shocked. I was shocked. I looked at some of the old games I used to play when I was a kid. They had options in some of the games where you could commit fornication for kids. Okay? But I didn't actually do it myself. But I took pleasure in those that do them. Hollywood movies, TV shows, those are my addictions. And a lot of brothers and sisters of Christ out there can testify that they have the same addictions I had. And I've got to keep my heart, keep this in my heart hardcore, or I'm going to fall back into the world. There's a change. I'm not that old man anymore. There's a change in your life. The old man is dead and buried. Prayer's making noise. The old man is dead and buried. Let's see if we can turn it off. The old man is dead and buried. Okay. I speak from experience. I have a testimony where I came out from all that stuff. And you know that those movies and stuff like that, you know what that leads to? Oftentimes it leads to you actually performing the act eventually someday. I was a fornicator in the flesh as a lost man. Wasn't just taking pleasure in them that do it. I was actually, I had a lot of sins in my lost life. I would never dare sit there and say I lived a clean life after God saved me and put a sh and shined a light on my life. I would never ever have the the pride to sit there and say, I lived a clean life. When I was first getting saved, I could have said, I predominantly, I mean, there's certain sins in my life. I had porn in my life. I knew that was wrong even before I got saved. That was wickedness. That's wrong because I, went, I was raised in the Babel building systems. 
and good morals according to the world, but the conviction never came in as far as the fear of hell. Where was the fear of hell? Eventually it came, it came about and I had a fear of hell. Okay, I knew I had some things in my life that I knew was wicked. But when God shined a light on my life, I just was shocked. I said, Lord, wow, I knew I was a dirt. I was, I, that's why I say today, Brother Jesus Christ, I was a dirty, rotten, filthy, low down, no good sinner on my way to hell. And I deserved, deserved to go to hell for sinning against God Almighty, my Creator. Righteous judge. Okay? Now, Brother Jesus Christ, I've said this in my testimony. When I say I speak from experience, I have it in my notes. When I went through my movies, I had over 300 movies. And I went through, and that whole list we're talking about there, where it promotes drugs, it promotes lick drinking, drunkenness, it promotes sodomy, it promotes fornication, it promotes feminism, it attacks God, mocks Christianity, true Christianity, and so on and so forth. By the time I was done, I got down to two Western movies that I thought were great. And I tried to overlook a couple things in them. Maybe it was just because I didn't see it at the time and God hadn't revealed it to me yet. But over time, those two westerns, old western movies that I had, eventually God showed me two parts in it. One was a drinking game. The other one was uh, fornication, prostitution. Just a small little scene that was really quick that you, you could almost miss it. And I had to give those up. Out of all my Hollywood movies, when it went down through the list, oh, and it didn't happen overnight, but me getting rid of all those movies took time. It took time. Okay, I kept trying to say, well, trying to justify overlooking sin in this one. Okay, this one's pretty obviously wrong. i got to get rid of it. This one's pretty obvious, but maybe this one's okay. And then a few months later, God starts pricking my heart with his word. Okay, I can't really overlook that sin, so that one's got to go. This one's really got... And then later on, it starts pricking my heart more and more. It's called sanctification. The Bible says, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. But these people who don't believe in a changed life believe, no, 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 you don't have to be sanctified by thy truth. It's just you say a little prayer. Call upon the name of the Lord. It means prayer. You ask God to say, it's just a little prayer. That's all you have to do is just say a little prayer. Now, don't get me wrong. Repentance. Prayer is part of salvation. Repentance. It's the part that they hate and don't mention. This whole conversation, this person was avoiding the word repentance. Coming to God broken and having sorrow for your sins, though they be great. Not that they be little, that they be great. And how great that sorrow is. Remember Jesus, the parable? He forgave the, the man owed 500 pence and another man owed 50 pence. And he forgave them both. Which one would love, will love him most? He's talking about to Simon, who's a um, yeah, Sadducee, Scribe, Pharisee. He was a Pharisee. His name was Simon. And it was when the woman came in and was crying. And Simon's like, if this man knew what kind of woman this was, she's a sinner that's touching him. Just a great sinner. And he looked at him and said, who will, who will love me most? And Simon goes, even Simon would goes, well, I, I, I suppose the man who he forgave most to, the 500. And he said, thou hast rightly judged. That's the point. You come to God fully broken and saying, I'm no good. In any way, I'm no good. There is no cleanness in my life. I'm no good. And today, it's just, it's so hard, brothers, this Christ, with false Christianity out there teaching people that you're a good person, you're a clean person, and all you have to do is say a little prayer and you get to go to heaven. But what happened to being broken? Coming to him as a dirty, rotten, filthy, low down, no good sinner. I'm guilty. Everything we just read there in Romans chapter 1, 28 through 32, through the movies, through entertainment, through visual. I'm pointing over here at my computer through visual. I'm guilty of all that. I, I would, you wouldn't catch me saying I lived a clean life before I got saved. No, 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 no. Not me. I might have, when I was newly saved, that's why I'm trying to give them a little bit of grace. When I was newly saved, I might have been like, well, I'm not, I, I was bad and I, I do, I, because of my sins, I desperately needed to get saved. But when this book started shining a light on my life, 
2 Timothy 2.15, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. When God starts shining a light on my life, I was wicked. I was 100, 200 times more wicked than I thought when God shined a light on my life. Every nook and cranny, there is no hidden place. God shines a light on all your life. There's, not, there's no such thing as a private life apart from from your walk with the Lord. When you get saved, He shines a light on everything. And you have a choice to make. God's way or the world's way. Pleasing God or continue to please your flesh. You can't serve two masters, the Bible talks about, because the third enemy is Satan. You can't serve two masters. Either you're going to serve God, keep His commandments, or you're going to serve Satan. You can't serve both. Right. That's where you get, that's where I get, I'm the chiefest of sinners. Now, as for you saying you lived a clean life before you were saved, my question to him and everybody else out there that attacks the changed life, let me ask you, what was Paul's attitude? What was Paul's attitude? Turn to Philippians 34. I'm oh, sorry, 34. 3 4. <laughs> you got to have the two dots in there. If you can't find Philippians 34, let me know. Uh, Philippians chapter 3, verse 4. Okay. This is Paul speaking. Though I, might, though I might also have confidence in the flesh. You know what that is? That's confidence in the flesh to say, I lived a clean life before I got saved. That's, that's a lot of confidence right there. Some people say it's pride. That's, I actually use the word pride. But we're, let's use the other word confidence. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he, were, that, that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel. Salvation is of the Jews. My Savior is a Jew. The Apostle to the Gentiles is a Jew. This book was written by Jews. We are adopted in. Salvation has gone out to the world. So now that we can get adopted in and be called the sons of God, be part of the body of Christ, praise the Lord for everybody that gets saved. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel of the tribe of Benjamin and Hebrew of Hebrews. As touching the law of Pharisee. Paul talks about being of the strict sect of the Pharisees. Six, concerning zeal, persecuting the church. I'm doing God's service. Remember what Jesus said? They that kill you think that they do God's service. When, Paul, when Jesus said that, you want evidence of that, coming, that prophecy coming true? Paul. Paul was going out killing Christians thinking he was doing God's service. As, but he had great zeal for the Lord. He was doing it for the Lord. But he comes up later and says he did it in ignorance. There's a lot of things that we thought, like I was a false convert. There's a lot of things I did thinking I was doing it for the Lord and being able to have my flesh too, you know, being able to um, have the world and be a Christian. And there were things I was doing for the Lord. But after I truly got saved and born again, I look back and go, okay, that wasn't for the Lord. Chapter and verse. That wasn't pleasing to God. Where's that in Scripture? But at the time, I thought it was pleasing God in my ignorance. Okay. Concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteous, which is of the law. Here's the key verse. Touching the righteousness, which is of the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. What was Paul's attitude before he got saved? Before he got saved, I'm a righteous man. I'm a good person. God had to break him. On the road to Damascus, God had to break him and real and show him just how weak he was and how worthless he was. I mean, he blinded him. He couldn't see. People had to lead him around for days. And he's going to a place he's not familiar. It's not like this house. I have this house. I'm familiar with this house. And if I go blind right now, I can kind of make my way around this house pretty good because I have memory of this house. He, got, he went to a place he didn't have memory of, and he's blind, he's worthless, he's sitting there, he can't do anything, he just feels so worthless, and God shines a light on his sins. 
Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? His sins. Now, but after he got saved, because remember, there's times where Paul said, I have to speak as a fool. He's not doing this to brag. He's not doing this to say, you know, look how great I was before I got saved. He's speaking as a fool. And, I, and, I, and this person here, I pray they're saved. They're speaking foolishly by saying, I had a clean life before I was saved. He's speaking foolishly. Well, I had a great life before I was saved. A righteous life. A good life. I mean, look. But what's his attitude after he got saved? At salvation and on. What was his attitude? At salvation and for the rest of his life. 1 Timothy 1.15. Turn to 1 Timothy 1.15. Um, let's go back to 12. And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who hath enabled me for that he counted me faithful, putting me in the ministry, who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it in ignorant and unbelief. That's the part about ignorant. And the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant with faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. God saved me. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, plural, multiple people, but sinners of whom I am chief. Now, some brethren are screwing up and they keep using that verse for present tense. Present tense, Paul does not think he's a pre chiefest of sinners. Right now, brothers of Christ, I don't believe I'm the chiefest of sinners, present tense. But this is talking about salvation. At salvation, I was the chiefest of sinners. Not Paul, I was. But what happened after salvation? God changed my life. You should not still be a 20-year Christian, you should not still be the chiefest of sinners. There should be a change in your life. You should have given your life to Christ. The old man is dead and buried. The new man comes up. God is my Lord, my King. He commands. You're my friends if you do whatever soever I command you. If a man love me, he'll keep my words. Thy word have I hid in my heart. I'll go over these again, that I might not sin against thee. Wherewith shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. Paul talks about, are we to sin that grace may abound? God forbid. Okay. Romans 6.1. What shall we say then? Let's go ahead and turn there. Romans 6.1. Are we to sin that grace may abound? This is Paul. I'm the chiefest of sinners. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How are we that are dead to sin to live any longer therein? There's a change. When Paul talks about being the chiefest of sinners, be careful, brothers in ministry and brothers and sisters in Christ, he's talking about at salvation. He had to come to the point where he's the chiefest of sinners. There's none righteous, no, not one. There's none that understandeth. There's none that seeketh out of God, after God. They've all, because he, he was religious, like he was seeking after God. No, nope, none. There's none that seeketh after God. They've all gone out of the way. They've together become unprofitable. There's none that doeth good, no, not one. No, not one. God forbid how we that are dead to sin live any longer therein. Know ye not that so many of us were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him in baptism and death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk, that's works, walk, it's action, in newness of life. It's physical. These people, oh, there doesn't have to be a changed life. It says here that you should walk in newness of life. Should. Because I've taught, but I said in this all another study, but I've taught that the, you can try to resurrect the old man. You can go back to looking foolish. You can go back to thinking foolishly. You can go back to talking foolishly. And you can go back to acting foolishly. You can go back to resurrecting the old man. 
And God is going to smack you around a little bit. He smacked me around a little bit. Actually, he smacked me around a lot. Okay. It says here you're supposed to walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. For it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. And this person here that says, hey, I gave up these things, I am almost guarantee you that there's a lot of other wicked things in his life that he's holding on to. And he's hiding behind the fact that he's hiding by attacking the changed life. Well, yeah, I gave this up, look, for show. I gave this up for show. I gave this up for the Lord. What about everything in your life that's wickedness? Like I said, God shines a light on your whole life. All of it. Oh, that's private. That's something just for me. You know, God, God, I got my thing with God over here, but this is just private for me. Nope. Doesn't work that way. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. I have this highlighted for uh, eternal security. He that is dead is freed from sin. Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. How's it eternal security? If we sin, I'm getting ahead of myself. If we sin, we have an advocate with the Father. He's faithful to forgive. But our heart's desire is we're supposed to be living that clean, changed life. We have a new master. We went from Satan being our master to God being our master, Jesus Christ. We're serving a new master. He commands, we obey. Is that your heartfelt desire to please God? Sin doesn't please God. Worldliness doesn't please God. There's brethren that are falling back into worldliness. Worldliness doesn't please God. Lust of the flesh. The flesh doesn't please God. There's brethren that are falling back into that. Satan's way. The old but what used to be your old master, now your new master is Jesus Christ. He's freed you from the old master. He's freed you from the world. He's freed you from your flesh. Your flesh, you're not flesh driven. Romans chapter 8 talks about that. Being carnally minded and walking after the flesh is the lost man. Being spiritually minded, walking after the spirit is the new man. There's a difference. There's a change. You're set apart from the world. But brethren are starting to look like the world and act like the world. But you have a lot of false converts that we're trying to reach for Jesus Christ that look like the world, act like the world, laugh at the world's jokes, and they'll get online and make comments like, this Bible is my final authority and you need to get in the Bible more. And you look at them and they're just so worldly. The fruit's there. I get frustrated with some of those people. The people attacking the changed life. You can't beat the book. We'll prove this. We'll keep going. We already proved it, but we'll continue to prove it. Okay. Luke 18.9. The reason for the title for this, Luke 18.9. What this reminded me of, the moment I heard him say that he lived a clean life before he was saved, it reminded me of Luke And he spake this parable unto a certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. I'm righteous. So this person here, when I backed him in a corner with the truth of the word of God, you know what they always run to? The people who fight the changed life? They always run back to salvation and say, I'm not saved by works. We're not talking about being saved by works. You're not saved by the changed life. The changed life comes after God saves you as evidence of salvation. We're talking about the life of a Christian. Now that you're claimed to be saved, the life of a Christian, there's supposed to be a new birth, a new life in Christ Jesus. You're supposed to be set apart from the world. You're supposed to be a light for Jesus Christ, and you can't do that if you're still looking like the world, acting like the world, and enjoy just sinning left and right. You can't do it. 
And we're talking about after salvation. And any time we talk about the changed life that comes after salvation, they'll run back to salvation and say, I'm not saved by works. Are you saying that someone can lose their salvation if they sin? That's the type of people we're dealing with. They love their sin. They want their sin. They don't, they're not sorry for their sin. That's what repentance is. You come to God broken. Godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of. You never regret repenting. You're, you never regret being sorry for sin. You never be sorry. Never be sorry. Okay. About being sorry for your sins. Oh, I'm sorry I gave that up for the Lord. Oh, I want that sin back. There's times where you can be tempted. Your flesh is like, oh, I want that back. But your soul that is now connected to Jesus Christ, your new body, that's why we call the body of Christ, is never going to repent of repenting. And it's godly sorrow. But you have these people that have no sorrow for their sin. They're not sorry for their sin. They love their sin. They justify their sin. And if you talk to them about their sin, they're going to go back to salvation and say, are you saying I'm, I, I'm saved by works? Be careful of those people. There's brethren... Uh, professing brethren that you confront and you're confronting them on their sin. Salvation's not playing part of it. There's, we're treating them like a brother or sister in Christ. They're saved and we confront them on their sin. Be careful of those people that always run back to salvation when you're just correcting them on their sin like the Bible says we're supposed to. My thing nowadays, brothers and sisters, if they want to go back to salvation, then let's go back to salvation. Preach the gospel to them. Treat them like they're lost. Or do you want me to treat you like a brother in Christ, correcting you on the scripture, saying what you're doing is sin and wickedness? No, if they want to go back to salvation, preach salvation to them. Say, you need to come to God broken in true biblical repentance. They keep wanting to go back to salvation, let's do it. I'm all for it. I love the gospel. I love the plan of salvation. I love talking about it. I love my, to giving people my testimony. How God saved a wretch like me. Let's start over. And he spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. This person here got mad at me at the end and started despising me. Because I kept everything I'm showing you, I showed him. Him or her, the person online, you can't tell who they are online. They despise others. I've had brethren that I've had disagreements with that their, their escape is, well, I'm just going to treat them like they're lost. Despise others instead of loving my brother like I'm supposed to, which is another situation. Verse two, 10. Two men went up in the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a publican. Remember we told, I told you a story about Jesus talking to Simon, the Pharisee that invited him into his house to eat, and the woman came in that was a prostitute? And fell at his knees and cried and washed his feet with tears and dried them with the hairs of her head. She, okay, it was a Pharisee. And when he told him about, there's a, a debtor and there's two people that owed him money. And one owed 500 and one owed 50. And he f frankly forgave them both. Which one will love him more? Pharisee, they know the truth. There's, you're without excuse. And the other, a publican. Publican's a tax collector. Taking money from people. You know, I couldn't think of being a tax collector back then. People were actually poor. Jesus talked about where he showed a woman that all these rich people were thrown in into their abundance. And this one woman threw in two mites, which is all that she had. Imagine that two mites, she's going to the store to buy some food so that we can live. And a tax collector, a publican comes along and says... You owe two mites. I need that. Plus, you owe more. But I, that two mites, I gotta take it. But we're not gonna eat. We need food. We need clothing. I gotta pay rent. Sorry, I'm taking it. Publicans also had money. It's a job. Show me one tax collector that's that's poor and living on the street. Show me one. Okay. Verse eleven. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. It depends on the life that. You have lived before you were saved. I already lived a clean life. 
The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the publican, standing afar off, would not lift up so much his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I still watch some of the martyr movies, and in one of the martyr movies, uh, Huss, John Huss, he's sitting there getting ready to get killed, and instead of yelling at everybody, why are they doing it? It's their fault. Why did he sang an old hymn, it's... Uh, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. Lord, have mercy on me. Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone that exalted himself... I'm a good person. I lived a clean life. I'm okay. I'm not that bad. Shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. Brothers and sisters of Christ, there are brethren out there that have testimonies where they had to come to God. That some brethren physically, the physical act, there's some brethren out there that they seem more wicked than me. But like I said, we just read there. I was into Hollywood movies, TV shows, video games, satanic style music, worldly stuff, visual. And the Bible says you take pleasure in what they did in those things, you're just as guilty as doing it. And when I put it together, it's like, I'm more wicked than they are. I've committed all those sins, and then some, by taking pleasure in it. Brothers and sisters in Christ, When we come broken, when it comes to repentance, it's not coming just as a sinner. Oh, I'm a sinner, you're a sinner, we're all sinners. And yeah, I'm a sinner, and, and I just said a little prayer and I got saved. You know, it's calling upon the name of the Lord. That's the change. That's the changed life. No, it isn't. Now, don't get me wrong. After salvation, you start calling upon the name of the Lord over and over to save you here, save you there. Lord, show me this. Prayer life starts. Show me this, Lord. Prayer life starts at salvation. Before salvation, actually, when you call upon the name of the Lord to be saved. But the true change is when you, when you call upon God to help you, you listen to Him and apply it to your life. Because there's times you can say, God, what should I do? And God says, do this. And you're like, eh, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to do this over here. And you fall flat on your face. But when you come to God broken, brothers, this Christ you and I have. And if you're a professing Christian as part of the easy believism and you come to this video... You don't come to him just as a sinner, brother, says Christ. You don't state a fact. If you say, I'm a sinner, what does that mean? Nothing. All you're doing is stating a fact. I'm a sinner. I'm just stating a fact. What's the difference? When true biblical repentance is not just saying, I'm a sinner. I'm a sinner. You're a sinner. We're all sinners. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. God Almighty, have mercy on me. Be merciful to me, a sinner. The difference is, is you're not stating a fact anymore, but you're having sorrow for those sins. You're having sorrow for that fact. You're also having sorrow for the consequences of that fact. You're a sinner, and you're going to go to hell for sinning against God. Put down here in my notes, implying how great that sin is, and the cost of that sin. See, when I was in the Bible buildings, it was all just, you're a sinner? Okay, great, now say this prayer, and you're saved. But what about the sorrow? Where's the brokenness? The Bible talks about, and I don't have this verse down here, but the Bible talks about that Jesus is a rock. And he'll fall on you. And he'll either break you and build you back up, or he'll ground you to dust. 
but one way or another, you will be broken. Either right now, or at the great white throne. Or if you die and go to hell, you'll be standing before Jesus Christ, the great white throne, and every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. You're going to be broken one way or another. The best time to be broken is today. The best time to be broken is here and now. Not at the great white throne. By then it's too late. Now is the day of salvation. Behold, now is the accepted time. Brothers, this is Christ. We just want you to push. And if you're a false convert out there that's been deceived by easy believism, you need to come to that brokenness and truly give your life to Jesus Christ. That's what we talk about. It's head belief. You miss heaven by 18 inches. The only way that belief is going to make it down here and what Jesus did on the cross, not the belief, but the fact. If you say, I believe Jesus died, was buried, and rose again, you're just stating a fact. That means nothing. The Bible talks about in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, how that belief is reprobate. It's reprobate. It's worthless. It means nothing. The people keep trying to leave this out. It's Romans uh, 15, uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, where it talks about it's not it's not that how it's how he died for our sins. For our sins. Personally, He died for my sins. Paul's preaching to save people that are false converts, I believe. Some are false converts. Some have forgotten who saved him, and they're trying to resurrect the old man. They're getting really messed up with the world, and he has to remind them. The number one thing, when a brother you see a brother in Christ that's really messed up, the best thing you can do is remind him of his salvation. Who saved him? Not his salvation, God's salvation, but who saved him? Why he got saved? To get him back on the right path. But once again, you have false converts attacking the changed life because they refuse to repent and believe. It's just head belief. They just said a little prayer. You just state facts without any faith behind it, just facts, because I want to be part of this club, and you have head belief. But you miss heaven by 18 inches. Never makes it down here. Why? Because you never came to him and let him break you. Those that be broken will be made whole. But those this rock falls on will ground into dust. You've never been broken. Okay. They just believe in or say or say a conscripted prayer. But you have someone there that believes they lived a clean life before they got saved. Just like the Pharisee we just read. Peter, or Paul, sorry, Paul talked about how he, he was a righteous man. He was a good man. And then at salvation, he was broken and realized, I am no good. I'm worthless. All of it worthless. And rejects the new life, new birth, new creature in Christ Jesus. I believe it is because this person still has a lot of worldliness and lust of the flesh that they are hiding or justifying. When you come across, this is for the brethren out there, when you come across, and for those who are this is talking to, check yourself. This isn't meant to be mean. I'm not being like trying to be domineering. I'm trying to get you to check your life and say, listen, I might have really gotten saved, but am I holding on to a lot of wickedness and sin in my life? I need to get busy living for the Lord. Time's running out. Time's running out for salvation for the lost world. Time is running out for you, brother and sister Christ, to be earning rewards, living for God, pleasing Him. You need to be doing that every day, looking for that blessed hope every day. Don't let people steal that from you. Now I put on here, I do not attack the new birth, and I fight, people's, I fight people resurrecting the old man. When you have someone who says that I was a good person before I got saved, that's a red flag for me. Something's not right here. Paul's attitude was, I'm the chiefest of sinners. I was horrible. I was wicked. My attitude at, at salvation and afterwards, especially when God shined a light on my life, how wicked and evil I was. Brother, sister Christ, you have the same attitude. If you're truly saved and born again, your testimony, I was wicked. There is no such thing as a clean life. I wasn't living a clean life before I get, got saved. It was 
100% worldly wickedness. I was doing it for myself. That in itself is, is sin. I wasn't doing it for my creator who created me. I was living for myself. It was all about me, myself, and I. Okay? I fight people resurrecting the old man. Because in these last days, the Bible talks about a falling away. And we're going to have a lot of people falling away. Don't start coming in and say, oh, maybe there wasn't a changed life. Maybe the changed life isn't that important. And you know what? You need to be a little bit more, you need to have a little bit more charity. Because they're trying to pervert the word charity into thinking that that means just look the other way. You need to have charity for people, which means look the other way. Let them live however they want. Let them do whatever they want. Just have charity. That's not what charity is. We've already talked about this. People abusing words in the Bible and perverting them. The changed life, the new creature, the new life, there's a change from the old man to the new man. Remember the story about Peter when he was denying Jesus Christ. They're like, you're different than us. You talk differently than us. What did he have to do to try to convince them that he wasn't with Jesus Christ? He had to begin to cuss and to swear. He had to start acting like the lost world so he could fit in and, tell, and get them to believe he had nothing to do with Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters Christ, when you start resurrecting the old man, you're trying to blend in with the world and try to tell the world you truly have nothing to do with Jesus Christ. And a lot of people are setting a bad example. Starting with this guy here, God had a lot to work on me when I got saved. My life was a complete and utter mess. He had a lot to clean up. And it wasn't because I was out there physically murdering people. I was a murderer. I was a rapist. I was a thief and, and this and that. No. But I took pleasure in those that did them. The movies that I had. Fornication. I was out there. I was fornicating. Um... So that was what I was doing, but there's other sins. Foul language, this, that, you hear it on the, the TV. I've had brethren say, I watch this channel and they have good health tips and everything, but you got to be careful. The guy cusses a, a lot, and, and, and I'm not for the cussing, but he's got some good information. How can you even stand the cussing to begin with? There's other people out there with good information that don't cuss. Find someone that doesn't cuss or read a book. Why is the compromising going on? Why is the resurrecting of the old man going on? Right. There are people who want the old man from the start. That's what I believe this person is. They want the old man from the very start. They don't want to give up the old man. The old man was never crucified with Christ. They love looking like the world, acting like the world. And they have the profession of a Christian. But they don't want the new life. If you're someone that came across here and God's finally breaking you, do you want the new life? It's not about you have to earn it. It has to do with you have to come to God broken personally. And having sorrow for those sins. Having sorrow for the cost of those sins. That's how you look to the, the cross and say, Jesus died. How Jesus died for our sins. How Jesus died for my sins. The wretched man that I am. Oh, who will deliver me from this body of death? Paul talks about his lost state. Who shall deliver me from this body of death? Oh, wretched man that I am. I thank God. He came in and saved me that now I can serve God. This flesh still pulls me down. Yes, I still sin from time to time. This flesh pulls me down. But I thank God. That, he's, that the power of God, the Holy Spirit, and through His Word, He cleans up my life and I can serve Him. Serve the Spirit. Okay. They do not want the new life, set apart from this world and putting down the flesh, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. When we ask them, are you in Christ Jesus our Lord? Oh yeah, I'm in Christ Jesus our Lord. Then why is it Jesus shining through you? Why aren't you set apart from this world? Oh, you don't have to. There's a new movement out there. Now it's not new. It's old. But before I was born, there's a new movement out there where it's easy believism. You just say a little prayer and you can still look like the world, act like the world, go the way the world's going. Okay? We don't have to turn here, but 
The next verse we're going to be turning to is John chapter 2. But Matthew 3 says, Bring forth therefore fruits meet for repentance. Matthew 7.20 says, Wherefore by their fruits ye shall know them. 1 John 4, 1 says, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God. Now stop. I always use this just the simplest thing. You see a man with long hair, the Bible says it is a shame for men to have long hair. And people say, well, it's a shame. I always go back to the Garden of Eden. They were naked and they weren't ashamed. Then they ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And now they are ashamed at their nakedness. Why? Because shame is sin. Evil. You're not ashamed of something if you're doing right. You're ashamed when you're doing wrong. But that's kind of hard for some people. That'll fight me on something like that. But it's a shame for men to have long hair. Now I'm using just a simple thing. Whether they are of God, try the spirits. The Bible says, judge not on the outward appearance. I had someone trying judging me on the outward appearance. And trying to get people to judge me on the outward appearance. Because I have a banner like someone else has. Or I have a beard like someone else has. Trying to judge me on the outward appearance. But the Bible says judge righteous judgment. When you're trying the spirits, you go up to that man and, and you talk to him and say, Hey, are you a Christian? Oh yeah, I'm a Christian. And you talk to him and say, Okay, what's the two commands God gives on the appearance of a man? If you're a sister, like a woman that you come across, what's the three commands God gives on the appearance of a woman? And you see what their attitude is towards this book. Those movies that you're watching, what's their attitude towards this book? That sin you have in your life, what's your attitude towards this book? And you get to the point where they love their sin, they don't have conviction, they, they justify it, they love it, they're not sorry for it. Oftentimes, I'd say 99% of the time, you're dealing with a false convert. If someone came in and pointed out the sins in my life, and they could prove it through the scriptures, I'm getting rid of them. I fought God at first. That's why we have grace for people who are newly saved. The changed life hasn't set in yet. God's just starting on them. God was just starting on me, and I fought him on certain things. I didn't want to let go of some things, and I fought him. And God smacked me around a little bit until I let go of them. All right? But what's their attitude towards the book? Just having long hair doesn't make you lost. Just because I saw someone watching a movie they shouldn't have been watching, that doesn't make you lost. But they'll always grab that and say, well... They bring it back to salvation, you're saying, because I sinned that sin, I've lost my salvation. No, 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 no. They can try to put that on us all they want, brothers and sisters Christ, but that's not the truth. The truth of the matter is, what's your attitude towards that sin? That's what I'm judging you on. We all make mistakes. We all fail the Lord from time to time. But don't use that as an excuse. It's a fact, but don't take that fact and turn it into an excuse. What's your attitude when you get corrected? What's your attitude towards sin now that you're truly supposed to be saved and born again? You're supposed to be in Christ. You're supposed to represent Jesus Christ to the world and be a light to the world. What's your attitude towards this book when it calls out your sins? What's your attitude towards this book when you're not doing what it tells you to do? Like 2 Timothy 2.15. Pray without ceasing. But try the spirits where they have God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Many false prophets have gone out in the world. Acts 17.10 says, These were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind. When someone comes, this is for the saved sinners out there, my brothers and sisters in Christ. When someone comes to correct you, do you have readiness of mind? you have the Bible out and readiness of mind? Or do you have a wall of pride? How dare they correct me? Are you above accountability? When Paul came to these people to preach the truth to them, the plan of salvation, okay, and that they searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. They searched the scriptures daily to see whether those things are so. When I come to you with the scriptures, and you come to me with worldly feelings and opinions and man's traditions and rudiments of the world, me, myself, and I, and I'm coming to you with the Lord and His Word, that's a problem. But if someone comes to you with His Word, for the brethren out there, because right now it's, the pride is destroying the brethren. When someone comes to correct me, do I have a readiness in mind? Do I have the Bible open? I have to check myself first. Judgment must first begin at the house of God. 
2 Timothy 4.10 says, For Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world, and has departed unto Thessalonica. Crescens to Galatia, Titus unto Dalmatia. What happened to Thessalonica? Why would he want to go to Thessalonica, having loved this present world? Did the Thessalonians start backpedaling? Instead of checking the scriptures night and day to see if those things were so, they just started becoming worldly? Why would he go to Thessalonica? Hmm. Could be a whole other study. But you have to love this present world. You have Demas that's forsaken him. Have to love this present world. You know what gets in the way of you in this book right here? The world. Lust of the flesh, your flesh. And Satan. And we're to judge. Bring, bring, therefore, bring forth therefore fruits meet for repentance. Whereby their fruits you shall know them. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits. Philippians 3, 8, 17 says, Brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them which walk, so you have us for an example. See, now, brethren, today don't like that. Because when we say chapter and verse, where was Paul doing this? Where was Paul doing that? They don't like that. Verse 18. For many walk of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame. When they should be ashamed, that shame there is meant to break you, brothers and sisters in Christ, and it did us. But that shame there, that sin, that shame of that sin, that conviction, is there to break us, to bring us to Christ. The laws are schoolmaster to bring us to Christ, to show us just how wicked we are. If you're, like I said, part of the easy believism, why are you glorying in your shame? Why are you defending no changed life? Why are you glorying in your shame? That's because you haven't been broken. Who mind earthly things. That's another trap for another study. But the, today, brothers and Christ, we have brethren out there. Their ministries predominantly are who mind earthly things. are pushing you to the world and getting you to look at the world and take your eyes off Jesus Christ. 20. For our conversation is in heaven. That's where Jesus is. The Holy Spirit is. The Bible says, "What He speak hears, that shall He speak." God the Father speaks to us through Jesus Christ and through the Holy Spirit. Where's God at? He's in heaven. So when you're reading this book, someone said once that this book is the only book that, when you read it, when you're saved and have the Holy Spirit, when you read it, the author is present every time you read it. For our conversation is in heaven. From whence also we look for the Savior. The Lord Jesus Christ. There's Paul again. Paul, you're so wrong. You're not supposed to be looking for the Savior because Jesus isn't going to come back in your lifetime. There's no imminent return of Jesus Christ. You get people doing that. Look. But we look for the Savior. We're looking for Jesus to come back every day with the life that we're living. Our conversation's in heaven. We're living for Jesus Christ every day. 2 Timothy 3.1 says, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves. I'm a good person. I'm not that bad. Who are you to judge me? There's some sins that are okay. I mean, we can find some way to make some sins okay and justify sin. Lovers of their own selves. Covetousness, which becomes idolatry. They start worshiping things of this world over the one true God, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ doesn't come first in their life. The world does. Covetousness. Boasters. Proud, there's that proud word. Blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers. False accusers? I've been falsely accused, and there's times I've been overly zealous, and I've falsely accused somebody else on accident, and I had to go and repent, and I had to go face that person face to face. There's a whole other study, but what's happening today, brothers and sisters Christ, is brethren are, act, are falling into the trap of, I don't have to love my brother in Christ, I can just treat him like he's lost. That saves me all the trouble, I don't have to go through all the steps that God says I'm supposed to go through and how I treat a brother. If I just try to make up an excuse, well, what if he's not saved? So then you don't do that. But when you've wronged somebody, you go to them and you apologize. If somebody's wronged you, you go to them face to face. You don't hide behind the stinking camera. I'm guilty of this. 
You don't hide behind the stinking camera. You go to them face to face and try to make things right and try to gain your brother. But we have a lot of false accusers today. Truce makers. Truce breakers. False accusers. Incontinent. Fierce. Despisers of those that are good. This person went from trying to like, I'm talking to you like I'm, I'm, I'm friendly, I'm a friend, I'm your friend, to despising those that are good. I had a changed life and he's despising that. That person. Oh, I was a good person before I got saved. They're starting to, they despise me because I have a changed life. Brother says Christ, if, when you have a changed life, because it's guaranteed, that's, if you're a brother and sister in Christ, you're going to have people that despise you. From, if you just think you're just so holy. Compared to the lost world, absolutely. Compared to my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, I got a lot of work to do. I got a lot of work to do. Compared to the world, absolutely, amen. Be holy for I am holy. Okay. Despise are to those that are good. Traitors. They'll turn their back on this book. The King James Bible. God's perfect written word in English. They'll turn their back on the major doctrines. Some are already slowly turning their back on the major doctrine. Like the pre-time of Jacob's trouble catch away the body of Christ. Believing in that imminent return goes hand in hand with that belief. But they're slowly falling away. Heady. High-minded. Almost goes under proud, being proud, and uh, uh, was it ego, right? heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. That's the that's the big key for what we're talking about when it comes to the changed life. Lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. Yeah, but what does the Bible say about serving two masters? Oh, that's just talking about money for instruction, righteousness. That applies to everything. You cannot serve two masters, period. Your flesh cannot be the master and Jesus Christ. The world can't be the master and Jesus Christ. Satan can't be the master and Jesus Christ. You can't serve two masters. And what you see here is you've got someone trying to love two masters. Lovers of pleasures, but the lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. And in the end... They uphold those pleasures, the lusts of the flesh, the world, their flesh, Satan, and they end up despising the one true God, Jesus Christ. And they become traitors going to the Bible perversions, going to these fake Jesuses that's Antichrist Jesus that's okay with your sin. They love, he loves your sin. Continue in it. All right. what's, wrong, what's wrong with these people? Having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. When you say that there's no changed life, you are denying the power of the gospel. Denying the power thereof. From such turn away. People always say, well, you know, people can have good works, the lost world can have good works, Remember, you don't judge on the outward appearance. If you see a man throw a hundred dollars donation in for the poor, let's say, you don't judge on the outward appearance, that actual act. You go to him and you talk to him and see where their heart is with that act. Lately, with people that have good works, when you back them into a corner, some of them are truly saved, born again. They do it to please God. They get nothing out of it. They do it to please God. You go talk to that man and put $100 in the plate. Why did you do that? Oh, I can do a tax write-off on it. Oh, I did that because everybody was watching. Oh, I just did that to please my wife. Where's their heart at? Spiritual judgment. That's what it is. And when you start judging people that have some good works... But you're looking at the bad. They always run back to their good works. No, I'm pointing out something you're doing that's wrong. Why are you bringing up the good works? We're, right now we're dealing with something bad in your life. A bad work. Okay? Titus 1.16 says they profess that they know God. But in works they deny Him. In works they deny Him? Yeah, being abominable and disobedient. They have works that deny Jesus Christ. This man here, this woman here, that's pushing that there's no changed life, she's denying the power of, of God. So in her works, she's denying Him. She's looking like the world, acting like the world, blending in with the world. But in works, they are denying Him. 
being abominable and disobedient. And, here's the key here, and unto every good work, it's reprobate. It's worthless. You're not getting any rewards in heaven because you're lost. You can't get rewards in heaven until you get saved. You get saved first. Then you start working on rewards in heaven. All your good works mean nothing without the blood of Jesus Christ washing your sins away. Coming to God broken as a repentant sinner. Have a godly sorrow for your sins. All the good works in the world don't mean squat. They're worthless. And you judge them if you judge. They want you. If a lot of people put on a show. They want you to judge them by their good works. But what's their attitude over here when you see this bad work over here? They can have 50 good works, and then you catch catch them with one bad work. What's their attitude? Then you realize there's a lot of evil and wickedness behind those good works, like worldly reasons. They ain't doing it for the Lord. They're doing it for themselves. Me, myself, and I. Remember what Jesus said about the Pharisees. On the outside, you look like whited sepulchers. But inside, you're full of dead man's bones. That's what that verse is talking about. Inside, you're full of dead man's bones. And every good work reprobate. The outside looks good, but inside, you're abominable. But in works, you deny him. But being abominable and disobedient inside. But outside, I do these little good works here and there. We'll try to hide the bad. Uh, no, we do good works, and when God and we pray that God sends a light on the bad, so we can get the bad out of our life, the changed life. Sanctify them to thy truth; thy word is truth. Now I told you to turn to Second John, because I had him say, "Well, what happens if you sin? If you sin, does it mean you lost your salvation?" They always try to bring it back to salvation when it comes to the changed life. They always try to bring it back to salvation when you try to call out somebody who professes to be saved and you point out their sin. There's been a recent disagreement between me and another brother in Christ. The moment he does, he starts putting out studies trying to get people to think maybe I'm not saved. I believe that brother saved 100%. Okay? They always bring up sin and try to bring it back to salvation. Okay, Be careful with that. I always look at someone who professes to be saved. When I go to correct them with sin, I treat it just like what we're talking about here. Let's look at cha uh, 1 John chapter 2. Um, verse 1 my little children these things write unto you that ye sin not now I want to stop there for a second John's attitude is you're to sin not Jesus' attitude is go and sin no more Paul's attitude are we to sin that grace may abound God forbid it how are we dead to sin living longer therein Peter's attitude was sin is bad get it out of your life you're not to sin anymore be holy, for I am holy. You get that verse, I think, from 1st 2nd Peter. Why don't you have these people that don't want to change life, why don't you have the same attitude as the early Christians had? Why don't you have the same attitude that Jesus Christ had? Go and sin no more. You've come to Him, He's forgiven your sins, your past sins, and He comes into your life. Go and sin no more. Why isn't your attitude the same as theirs? Oh, John, you're teaching sinless perfection, John. That's what you're doing. John, just all these people, they, they, they're, they're men, and men make mistakes. And How about we keep reading? What happens if you sin? Do you lose your salvation if you're truly saved and born again? No. But like we read over there, when you're lost, and you try to do good works to hide that, and try to play religion, and just play Christian, those good works aren't going to save you. Good works come after salvation. But if you sin, let's keep reading. And if any man sin, John understands. Paul even talks about it. If you sin, repent. Paul, Jesus himself said, if the man come after me, he has to deny himself repentance, take, take up his cross daily, forsaking that sin, and follow me. I'm talking about Jesus Christ. They don't understand that you still sin. But they push, you sin not. That's what we're supposed to push, brother, says Christ. You're supposed to, your heartfelt desire is, I don't want to sin against God anymore. It doesn't please Him. Why was I created? For thy pleasure they are and were created. For thou hast created all things. I'm talking about Jesus Christ. And for thy pleasure they are and were created. 
If any man sins, John knows people sin, I know people sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous, and he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Propitiation. I got in arguments with people because they don't understand what that word means. I've got a Webster's 1828 dictionary. The one on the website's not working. I'm pointing over at my computer. The website's not working. But propitiation, they'll say, well, he's forgiven the sins, and he's already forgiven the sins of the world. No, he paid the price of the sins of the world. He paid for the sins of the world as far as the price, the ultimate price. But your sins are not forgiven if you don't go to Jesus Christ through the cross and what he did for you. We all have to stand before Jesus Christ. The saved did it. We weren't standing. We were kneeling and flat on our face before the cross. You can either come to Jesus Christ at the cross or you're going to be standing for him at the great right throne. Which one do you want to do? And we are pushing, brothers and sisters Christ, we are pushing. Any lost person that comes across this, we want you guys to come before Jesus Christ at the cross. And we came before Jesus Christ at the cross. Propitiation means ready to forgive. It doesn't mean present tense, he's forgiven everybody and every sin. Ready to forgive. What happens when you sin? You repent, forsake, and you get back to your walk with the Lord and living for the Lord every day. But why is it they can't handle that? They always try to run back to salvation. No, 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 you're trying to teach works-based salvation. You're trying to teach that I have to have a changed life and then get saved. That's a lie. That's a total lie. Brothers and sisters in Christ, we came to the point where we were broken and we were no good. This person would do well to get his heart right with the Lord, his or her right with the Lord, and go back to salvation, even if they are truly saved, to go back to salvation and remember why they got saved. And start submitting themselves to this book and not the world. Submit yourself to the Lord through the Holy Spirit by this book. And stop submitting yourself to the world and to your flesh and to Satan. The Lord God through His Word. So I just wanted to do a response to this because, Brother says Christ, I love the Gospel. I love leading people to Christ. I love God's Word. And I love my brothers and sisters in Christ. Okay. I love you, brothers and sisters Christ. Um, remember, in these last days, don't use what's going on in the world to start falling apart and start falling into the world. Be careful. I'm not telling you who to watch. But be careful of ministries that we just read there, that their eyes are on the world. They're getting distracted by the world. Their eyes are on the world. They start to fall back into the flesh and promoting the flesh. They start doing things Satan's way. Pride starts coming in. The ministries that promote pride, that promote bearing false witness, backbiting, whispering, slander. Be very careful. And it's not just that. Ministries that promote sin, saying, hey, worldliness is okay, and you can still blend in with the world, and you can still... I'm separate from this world. When I got saved, this is my heritage. This is my family. Okay? This is my life. But this is Christ. I pray it's yours. Don't resurrect the old man. One of the things I didn't put down here that they said on there is they said that some people, they'll say there's no, cha there's, no, there's no change life. And then they'll say, well, and some people can backslide. And I had to bring that up to them. I said, you do realize what you just said there. You're, you're confirming that there's a change life. If you use the word backslide, then you're confirming what we're saying, that there's a changed life. How can you backslide from the new man to the old man if there was never a new man to begin with? Never a new man to begin with. Brothers and Christ, keep standing for the new life, the new creature in Christ Jesus. Keep standing to having a zero tolerance for sin in your life first. And my life is what I focus on first. Sometimes I get distracted by other people and God says, well, what about you? What about your life? Before you start worrying about other brothers and sisters in Christ, what about you? We need to judge ourselves first. Have zero tolerance for sin in our life, then try to have zero tolerance for sin in the brethren's life, and then do our best to abstain from all appearance of evil. This home is an abstain from all appearance of evil, free home, praise the Lord. It's the only place, this and out in the boonies, is the only place that I can be abstained from all appearance of evil. 
So when I go into town, I'm always having to look the other way. Not look the other way like I'm okay with it. I'm talking about to avoid staying from appearance of evil. I hand out gospel tracts. That's wickedness. That's sin. But I don't go out of my way to have sin in front of me. We're supposed to have a zero tolerance for sin in the world, too. You know how you fight the world? I know a brother was coming up with this once and saying, talking about how to fight the world. You know how you fight the world? By living a life of Christ. That's how you fight the world. Having a zero to tolerance for sin and worldliness, sin and Satan in your life. Having a zero tolerance for the world, worldliness and the flesh, lust of the flesh, sin, and Satan in the life of the brethren. And have a zero tolerance for it in the world. You live for Jesus Christ every day and you be a light to the world. And when the world's going this way, when God says that's wrong, you don't go that way. You want to know how you fight this wicked world? Through being a light for Jesus Christ. And why do we do that? So we can lead people to Christ. We don't do it so it's, look at me, I'm just so holier than thou. I don't live the life that I live because I'm doing it for me, myself, and I. Yes, I get rewards in heaven. Yes, I want to please my Savior, my Creator, God Almighty. But God show me that the number one reason why you do it is so you can lead people to Christ, the real Jesus Christ. You don't create false converts. These worlds that lukewarm with no changed life, Babel buildings, they're creating false converts. We're supposed to have a light. I told you what's in your heart. There's two perfect things you can hide in your heart. Jesus Christ by the Holy Spirit and the God, Word of God. There's two ways you're, you testify for Jesus Christ. You do it verbally, witnessing, testimonies, witnessing for Jesus Christ verbally, and the life that you live is a testimony and a witness for Jesus Christ in your life. Be careful. Don't become part of the no change, no change. I thank thee I'm not, that I'm not as other men are. Don't fall for that, brother, says Christ. Don't start falling back into the old man and setting a bad example for who... Uh, a saint is supposed to be born again, bought with the blood, washed in the blood. Don't start setting a bad example. There's a lot of false converts out there calling themselves Christians. We're supposed to be true Christians. Okay? Please, 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 don't fall into that trap. And this person here, if they end up watching, that came across the gospel message on this channel on YouTube. I have a channel also on... Um, Rumble, um, you come across this channel, this isn't meant to attack you, the person who made these comments here. It's not to attack you, it's to get you to go back to this. This is the solution. This has absolute truth. This says that there's a repentance, there's a new creature, that there's going to be a change in your life. Old things have passed away, behold, all things have become new. All things. Not, well, I get to keep some because I lived a clean life before. All things become new. You stop living for yourself. Stop living for the world. Stop living for yourself, the flesh. Living for your old master, Satan. You live for your new master. And it's all about Jesus Christ. I keep pushing and keep pushing because I'm pleading with all my heart, brother, it's just Christ, to the law, to these false Christians out there or to brethren that are backsliding. You can only backslide if you had a change to begin with. So, brothers and sisters of Christ, stand firm in these last days. The real way to fight what's going on out there today, to fight the evil, remember the Bible says, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. How do we fight what's going on out there? Prayer. Giving God glory in all things. Giving God thanks in all things. Living a life of Christ. Like I said, having, having a, this in your life 100% and zero tolerance for the world. Worldliness. Lust of the flesh. Satan. That's how you fight what's going on out there. The world is always falling apart. The world's always going the wrong way. But this is how we fight it, brothers and Christ. And prayer is big and important. Make sure you're getting back into prayer. So grace and peace from God our Father. Grace and peace. Grace and peace. When this is the center of your life and it's in your heart and you have that changed life and you're living according to God's word, all things work together to them that love God. What did Jesus say? 
If a man love me, he will keep my words. If you're doing your best to keep God's word, all things will work together for good. All things will. For those of us who are keeping his word, all things are working together for good. To them that love God, to them that are called according to his purpose. Grace and peace is what I want for the brethren, not division. People keep pushing that. I want division. I don't want division. I want grace and peace. I want unity. I want us to be of the same mind and the same judgment, one body striving together. But some brethren have to let go of worldliness. Some brethren have to let go of lust of the flesh. Some brethren have to stop, realize that they've fallen into Satan's trap and they're getting very prideful. And they got to let go of the pride. Grace and peace from God our Father. And it only comes from God our Father through the Holy Spirit and through His Word. Grace and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all, brothers and sisters of Christ, and my love for you. I'm here. My love for you, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. This, e this ministry has an email address. Email me. I've had some brethren email me, talk about it. I'll try to get with you about fellowship. I desperately want some fellowship with some good brothers and sisters in Christ. Um, but remember, you can't beat the book. Don't pervert this book so you can go back into having this world. Or like these people are. No changed life. So, I will see you in the next video, brothers of Christ.